నమస్కారం గారు నమస్కారం అండి ఎలా ఉన్నారు సంతోష్ గారు బాగున్నారు సార్ మీరు ఎలా ఉన్నారు గుడ్ అండి నైస్ సి so uh, with in continuation to previous topic of vedic approaches and management and uh, second part ga manam ante dantlo unna content chusaka we thought we should do uh, an extended topic so vedic management part 2 so this will be uh, in precise and uh, with reference to exclusive to bhagavad gita dantlo the extract of bhagavad gita with reference to the characters as positions in different organizations and uh, situational decisions about you or strategic decisions about you what are the crux of leadership the profound roles in bhagavad gita what is the extract of those roles with reference to bhagavad gita and how can we align to management thought process lo manamu ok topic teeskundam anukunnam so from the window of bhagavad gita and management who are the people you see as profound leaders in the complete book of bhagavad gita and what are the uh, narrations that we can what are the extracts that we can take from those people which can well into the modern management first thing and i i don't really look at any of those characters directly and i'm not interested in looking at what did drona do what did bhishma do what was appropriate what not enduk antunna nenu i am interested in learning what i can from bhagavad gita so that my actions get shaped by my learnings from there from that context you san ante nenu i will look at it and say ipudu emiti meer cheppin daniki nenu ela chustanu ante ipudu bhagavad gita chattunnapudu i will try to see whether i am arjuna endukante bhagavad gita is directly told to arjuna so i will look at it and say in what context am i reading bhagavad gita what war is going on in my life or in my mind or in my company or in my relationship that i want to resolve by reading bhagavad gita so that means before i read bhagavad gita i think about bhagavad gita as a problem solving manual yeah and so from that context i will look at it so either i am going to be arjuna or i am going to be sanjaya because he is the one who interpreted what arjuna and krishna are talking about to dhritarashtra so i will try to look at it from that angle or i will look at myself if i am telling something to my children or if i am mentoring somebody and i have he is behaving like arjuna then i will try to look at myself as the krishna and see what are the methodologies that krishna used to communicate and convince arjuna who did not want to fight the war what are all the argument approaches what are all the argument strategies which krishna used to actually get arjuna to fight the war so i will try to think about it from application perspectives when it comes to management endukante the moment i think about bhishma drona karna arjuna krishna all of that first of all it will only become applicable to indians it will only become applicable to hindus it will only become interesting to people who are already uh, who have studied uh, bhagavad gita or who are interested in intellectual perspectives and cognitive interpretations of some of them for understanding bhagavad gita but as a management professor as a coach in that particular context i can't afford to do that i need to really gather the student bring that person's mind to how to use bhagavad gita as a karma yoga how to use bhagavad gita as a upanishad that tells him what to do the connection between that those are the two context in which i try to use bhagavad gita you follow yeah. so from that yeah. perspective i am sorry that uh, my answer is not straight forward to your question uh, what i understood is going by characters we go by abilities of the characters so that's what i think you are trying yeah. to convey so which is very much amazing that's not i mean you want to define them by a name you want to define them uh, by the abilities of the characters and uh, what yeah. they have done that becomes applicable to you and me right away 
Yeah. <laughs> In fact, so for yeah. example, I have a family business. Okay. Let us say I'm the first generation entrepreneur who started my own. I started a small shop. Then I grew it into multi shop, lots of different shops in the same town. I've created a chain. Then my son and my brother's family, my sister's family, you know, second generation, there are about six people who joined and they're all managing different branches. Then I realized the grandkids who have come, who are actually beginning to do, they're beginning to fight. My father did more, my sister did more, and we should get this, and we need to be doing this, and all of that. So we sent them to various places. And now they are saying, I'm favoring this kid, or I'm favoring that kid, and somebody is really, because he's the kid of the family, and he's really apple of the eye for many of the people, he is leveraging that to cheat his brothers and sisters, cousins. I don't like that. So I'm really harsh to that kid. Now people are saying I'm unfair to him when compared to that. So if I try to look at it from there, I love him a lot. But what he is doing, I'm not willing to accept. But at the same time, as the karta leader for this kind of family business, I have to make some decisions that may not be like either by my children or by my grandchildren. But I have to play a certain role and I have to be fair and I have to follow certain dharma. According to that, I'll do. And uh, from that perspective, I will look at a Bhishma character or I will look at uh, some other characters in there. So it is action that is going to be important, application that is going to be critical for me. So since you have quoted Bhishma as I mean, one of the uh, profound, so he has got many opportunities of interfered, let me put in another way. Since he knows both the families and they are the people who grown up with him. So don't think that someone like him should penetrate, step into the into a situation to resolve the conflict at earlier stages, someone like Bhishma or someone like Drona or someone like uh, Rasta. So they know that what is what might happen. So don't you think that they have an option to take it further, to move ahead and stop the situation at very early stages. They are very good at what they are doing. They know what is Dharma and they, they know the kids, and they know the family and they know that there could be a conflict. So how can we see that? What would have been the situation if they would have taken one step ahead in a very early stages to resolve the conflict? See, I see this uh, all the time in Silicon Valley. There is a company which has grown to $2 billion. It was started by a single entrepreneur and that entrepreneur had hired two people whom both of them actually he hired, got them to develop different slices, one service business, one product business, gave it to both of them. For whatever reason, one guy got into issues because he had cancer or something like that. He became unable to run the business. So till we find another person, we kept the first guy to be in charge of both the businesses, okay? And when the prodigy that he developed, when he took over, essentially, he said, uh, we are not going to divide these businesses as a product business and uh, services business. My boss has done very well. And, uh, you, you know, now there are so many interdependencies on it. If you try to break it up into product and services business, Actually, the redundancy will be too much. The costs will go up. We will not be able to satisfy the shareholders. We will actually, the new guy who comes in, will take a small piece, let him prove himself. Then someday, once he proves himself and once he can do very well, then we'll try to divide this in a way that it is appropriate. Now, this guy is on the board of uh, trustees, board of directors, you know, the original co-founder. Uh, but at the same time, he could say, nope, it's not possible. But at the same time, it's a public company. I can influence, but I need to influence it at the board level. That means I need to get various board members to agree. But when you are in a board, even though you're an entrepreneur, if you are an old uh, guy who has done that, but you know the memory here is like three months, if you have not touched base with me, I don't know who you are anymore. 
so if i haven't seen you perform very well in this quarter then whatever you have done before it doesn't matter to me so i need to convince each and every person on the board so that at least half the people will vote for me but the problem is because this second guy has already been running the company and he has really kept his board in his pocket i am the only one who believes that it is unfair and this is not the right way to do it because in my belief that we do need to separate it out that's why i even created the product and services business and there are several advantages that are there for the product business that the services business will not be able to do services business will sabotage itself actually combining it overall it will become more of a consulting business rather than a product business product business gets a much better return but this fellow because he has grown up in a consulting and services world he is actually sabotaging himself and he is sabotaging the business i know he is unfair but how am i going to convince anybody else and in the meantime somebody else came to overtake the company somebody else has put a bid to buy the company they want to create a product business and services business separately but the problem is this is my company i need to support my company even though my protege is not doing very good but when there is an enemy that comes in to buy and uh, do that i need to create a poison pill and i need to you know, work with him i need to do it it is my duty to support my company i cannot just do something else so there are several factors i can think about and i can take the lessons from bishma because i know bishma actually learned from the you know gods themselves including from parashurama and what are the ethics he knows what is dharma and what is adharma at that particular context only problem is he is like a professor of dharma he is not a practitioner of dharma why he never became a king he was only an advisor to the king but he was not a king because he did the bhishma pratigna long time ago to his father and to his uh, stepmother saying that i will never rule the kingdom so even though he was eminently eligible to take it but he has taken an advisor role so when doing it what needs to be done he doesn't have a practical specific knowledge of what he needs to do so what did bishma do really made a bishma pratigna to protect the kuru kingdom he blindly supported whoever is the kuru king even though he is fighting krishna he is fighting pandavas same way we all get into a situation where we become what you call blind to what are the essential dharma principles that i need to follow in doing what i am doing in my organization and i need to really think about how to apply some of these principles you can't just say bishma did that or you cannot just say oh krishna told uh, arjuna to hit karna when he was down or to hit on the thigh because it is against the dharma for duryodhana uh, so that he can kill him because it is not legal you know what there are ethical principles that are not related to only that situation so you need to look at it is like a nested loop you need to think about what is behind that what is behind that what is behind that and then think about it in a systematic and a systemic way to judge whether some actions in the overall context are coming out to be fair unfair legal not legal dharma adharma when we learn to do things at that type of a comprehensive level 1 meta level and then the underlying purpose that's why most organizations are now no longer satisfied by strategy alone or the vision alone once upon a time people used to say visionary leaders vision alone is not sufficient because from somewhere else somebody else could become a competitor like for example ford uh, or toyota or hyundai gen- uh, competition the biggest competition did not come from automobile industry it came from tesla 
where they look at Tesla as a computer on four wheels. So, and then now if you look at Tesla, even though uh, Tesla stock has been going up and down quite widely, its market cap is larger than the next 10 automobile companies put together. Toyota, General Motors, Ford, you know, Nissan, Mercedes-Benz, it doesn't matter, all of them. Put together, Tesla is more valuable. Why is that? They changed the paradigm. They came up with a new way of thinking. So similarly, we need to learn to see what is the new principle that is applicable that will be appropriate for today. When we learn to think like that, then vision alone doesn't cut it. You need to come up with a purpose. Why am I doing it? So the purpose-driven planning, purpose-driven vision is more meaningful these days for organizations. So maybe purpose, values, ethics, you know, customer satisfaction, employee satisfaction, you know, and then overall, the society in which you are situated, how do you serve that? Like, for example, Tata Group, Tata talks about uh, rejuvenating the country. Their Tata Group, Tata TCS or Tata Steel or Tata Motors, all of them, when they make the money and goes into Tata Sons, Tata Sons uses quite a bit of that for uh, what you call for the country improvement. So that's a larger purpose for which they make the profits, not just to put it into pockets of other people. See, those are dharmic approaches and those are the ways we need to think about uh, how we interpret Vedanta or Vedas into current management. Otherwise, we will trying to interpret the characters from a particular context. Maybe that particular context might have a meta phase and even a meta meta phase if we don't understand that, number one, understanding why some things are done. Number two, applying it in a way that we can benefit from those texts. Thank you for asking this question because what you are asking are extremely important. If we mindlessly apply what has been done without thinking deeper implications and deeper reasons, then we can take the Vedic management principles as a big cricket bat and hit everybody on the head with those cricket bats saying, I am right, I am dharmic, and you are a dharmic. That would go exactly up against the principles of actually Vedic management. Tolerance, purna madam purna midaha, we say. That and this are complete. The purnatvam principle is, you know, you know, is like a fundamental core. Tolerance is fundamental core principle. So like that, there are some tenets. We need to really look at what dharma means and how do we apply that to today, our companies and our work. So exactly. I mean, we have to say that So principles key, purpose key. I'm just trying to extract the purpose. And so when we are reading principles, we have to extract the purpose of the principles. So even when we read Bhagavad Gita, we have to know the purpose of the Bhagavad Gita, not just to go by what they said. Purpose and when you ask a question, why should I do this? Why should I follow Bhagavad Gita? Why does Bhishma do what he did? Why should I actually follow Guru Granth Sahib or, uh, you know, what you call uh, Bhagavad Gita or uh, Jataka Katas or any of them for that matter? If you know why you want to do that first, before you follow what are written in there, then there is a clarity that comes. So if I take a management uh, literature and management terminology, and if I try to convert it into this, when you ask a question, how do I do what I need to do? Those are strategy questions. Strategy answers the question, how? What should I do? And what should I do now becomes the tactics and the immediate goals. But if I ask, what is the big picture here? What are we trying to achieve? What are our you know, bigger goals? That becomes the vision, right? And if you ask, why is that we need to have that vision? 
why is that becoming number one in industry is important why is that we need to become a unicorn why is that we should actually buy that company when you ask that then you are getting into domain of what is called mission or purpose so when we know why what and then how then we have a certain framework for making things happen in a particular way so that is something that becomes extraordinarily important to be able to yeah definitely definitely it answers so for me the exact is the whole factor the why factor and having a vision out of it so second phase na ko final ga ardham cheskundi le ante overall synopsis of vedic management part two le ante em anipinchindi ante rather than going by the principles or along with going by the principles having a purpose understand the purpose of why it was written why the principles of written and what is the purpose of the principles and what is the vision that it is showing us to implement to narrow down the point so we need to understand the purpose of bhagavad gita and the rules the characters how they behave be more situational being principled and having a vision and the decisions are more subjective going in meta and meta phases as you explained clearly so i think that is a narrow down synopsis of this part sir there is one more part which we may want to look at just a small thing yeah. to add to what you are saying when you understand the purpose why you are doing it you develop a perspective you develop a mental model see for products and services you you know when you want to innovate you have a product mindset or a services mindset similarly when we talk about a new kind of business we are doing we need to come up with a new business model just like a products model or services model you need to come up with a new business model when you change the business model you can get money in different ways or lose money in different ways if like jio came and changed the business model and airtel and uh, you know all other people got shaken up suddenly jio became big right so that is called a business model change the third one and most important what i am saying is when you look at a purpose why you are doing what you are doing it comes down to mental model change for companies or individuals we need to change their perspectives we need to change their mental models we need to change their paradigm in which they are operating if we don't change the paradigm in which they are operating the perspectives we do completely different so that becomes the guideline by which the company needs to operate from so that is the first level is purpose will help you to develop a perspective second we need to have principles what are principles values when they are applied they become principles okay applied values are principles not just saying i know i need to treat customers nicely that's a nice value but when you say when the customer comes into the shop 1 2 3 4 4 whatever is appropriate do these following steps do this things and find a way in which customer goes away happy even if you do a little bit of change here little bit of change there you give them a little bit take a little bit work with them in such a way customer always leaves your door step happily because then chances are that person will return to you the customer acquisition doesn't have to be too bad so make sure don't think about customer buying only this and making the maximum profit in this transaction look at it like you can attract the customer to come back to you and you can make the customer to refer to somebody else those principles will be very good so perspectives then principles which is taking the values that you have and creating them into operational way in which you can create processes around it okay that is uh, then how do people practice it in different branches in a small branch in a village if you try to put all these formalized processes they will become too bureaucratic and actually the customer will run away you may have to the practice in a small town a practice in a mid size practice with a large customer practice with a government customer the practices have to be very different principles may be exactly the same perspective is exactly the same but you have to create different rituals 
different practices, different ways of engaging different kinds of customers. So that means practices are at the ground level. Principles are at a meta level. Those create the processes which have to be customized from branch to branch, individual to individual. Then uh, both of them are guided by perspectives. Asking a question, why should I do it? Oh, this is what we are trying to do. This is our mission. This is our perspective. So we do what we do. So when you can bring it into these three, it becomes very, very powerful to think about. Like a religion gives you a perspective. Hindu religion looks at everything as whole. Buddhist religion looks at everything as empty and removing Dukkha. So like that, this one, spirituality gives you principles because it is value driven. But how we live our life day to day, how we apply all these in our management becomes practices. Practices can be, that is the way you can take Bhagavad Gita, same perspectives, same principles, but in different countries, in different places, they can apply by creating different practices. So I hope uh, this is clear. Thank you yeah, very much for sir. wonderful questions again. I appreciate it. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a very good session. So probably I'll conclude with purpose along with the practices. So if we have the right practices with knowing the purpose, that creates a vision. Okay. I think that's how and that can be the takeaway of part two, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Andy. I enjoyed uh, talking with you.